If you haven't bought your graduate gifts yet, give you a few ideas. You know, there are certain things that uh, kids need, young people need as they go out on their own. And so, so just a few ideas here. Uh, the first thing that always is appropriate for a young person is uh, money. So there's a cute little uh, graduate's mortarboard on top of a glass full of money. Then, you know, if you know that they're going to college like these kids were sharing, if they're going to be in the dorm, you always have to traipse perhaps down the hall to uh, use uh, the shower. And so a little shower caddy might be handy, too, for those that are doing that. Then, uh, well, let's, let's see what else we have there. You know, you got the gag gifts, the ones that they probably won't wear very much, but hey, you know, class of 2022 uh, socks, and then, oh, here, money. Money's always a good gift for kids, right? Uh, what if they just want to have a little snack in their dorm room, or maybe they're going to live in an apartment? Well, you know, you can get a popcorn popper. They, they aren't going to start a fire with that kind right there, and maybe they can even dry their hair in a pinch. <laughs> and then you got uh, snacks again. That's always a handy thing for kids. And then in case you're still trying to figure out what to get them, uh, a little dough would always be appropriate. So just a few ideas for the college or high school graduates in your, uh, in your world. Um, you know, when you start thinking about moving away and, and getting out on your own, it wasn't my first year, but it was my second year that, you know, it, it was almost as good a graduation because you know what it was? For me, it was a graduation from a dorm room to an apartment. Oh, the freedom, right? I went to Baylor University. We had a curfew. And you had to be back in the dorm by a certain time. And uh, you had to, all, all this. So, so that, that, that apartment, it represented a lot of things. But also, with my lack of uh, financial uh, uh, amounts to, the, to, to go out and eat and all of that, it also meant I was going to have to learn to cook. And there were going to be four of us in the apartment, and we had all these plans. Each of us is going to have responsibility. And so I wish I had a book like this one. This is another gift. If you know they're going to be out on their own, three-ingredient baking. You know, that, that just three sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, if, it's, if, it, if it can't be Taco Bell or whatever hamburger joint is down the street, three is good. And so uh, I, I was surprised to find there, there are books with as many as 500 three-ingredient recipes in them. I don't know how in the world that would be much good, how the, the variety might sort of lack after a while. But three ingredients, you know, you can do a lot with three ingredients. And we're going to see in our Bible passage today that there is a simple recipe, a three ingredient recipe given to young men and young women as they go out on their own and as they seek to follow God. We're in the book of Proverbs, the third chapter this morning. Beginning in verse 1, we read this. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. The first few 
chapters of the book of Proverbs are written by wise King Solomon. We're told in the scripture he's the wisest man who ever lived and that he was sought for his wisdom. People who heard about it, kings and queens, they would come to check it out and they would leave unanimously saying it is true and blessed are the people of Israel who have such a king. But you know what? Even the wisest of people, when they look at their own kids, they have to say, listen to me, I've got something to say. How many of you, and, and I'm going to ask this question of the ones who are older, so, so kids, you just sit back because you aren't able to answer this question yet. How many of you would say, that your parents knew more when you got older than they did when you graduated high school? Did, did, did they end up being, you, you said, you know, they're pretty smart after all? Yeah, yeah. We just don't have that ability to understand it. And so he's writing and he's saying, oh, son, please listen. I have something to say to you. And he gives in verse 7, that's where we're going to focus this morning, Three simple ingredients for a healthy and happy life. And the first ingredient that he speaks of, the first one I want to consider with you this morning, is a healthy humility. A healthy humility. He says, do not be wise in your own eyes. In other words... Understand that you have a lot to learn and be humble in your relationship with others. There is a temptation to want to present a confident front and for some reason we sort of think that that means we have to act like we know it all. We have to act like we know it all. But there is a difference between healthy humility and cockiness. Cockiness says, don't tell me what to do. I can handle it or I can bluff my way through it and figure it out. And guess what? Cockiness leads to a whole lot of hard knocks on the head and on the soul. When you think that you have to pretend you know things that you really don't. Cockiness is dangerous at, at work. It could get you killed depending on what kind of work you're doing. It's dangerous at school. And it's dangerous in the relationships you're going to seek to build through the years. To pretend like you know all things. I'm reminded, I believe it was Abraham Lincoln, wasn't it, who said the person who represents themselves in court has a fool for a lawyer? That's the cocky person. I know what I need to do. Healthy humility, on the other hand, it doesn't shy away from advice. It isn't afraid to ask questions of those who have experience. It believes that the best person, the best route that a person can have to making a decision is you gather the information, you listen, you learn, and then you humbly advance. You don't know it all. Neither do your young friends. And neither necessarily does Google. You know, if, if you're basing your life choices on what a search engine gives you, you're going to take some lumps. Find voices of experience around you, people who have gone ahead of you. Seek out those who are wise in the areas that interest you. I know I was just talking with Danny before service and said, How, how'd your college year go? Are you still in the same manger? And she said, I came out and I'm more certain. 
And I think that a big part of that is because she probably talked to people who helped her along the way. She said, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. And you can see what she's training to do. Your journey down the road of life will be much smoother if you humbly listen and learn and then act rather than trying to do things all on your own. We need to listen to other people, but there's a certain, a second source of wisdom that we need to consult regularly, and it's found in the pages of the Scripture. Just right above our focal verse, we have verses 5 and 6. I shared it at the banquet the other night. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. We, did we jump something there, Jason? Yes. Okay, yeah, that, we'll, we'll come back to that one. Let's go on and do 2 Timothy right now. God's word will help us. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. See that humility there? And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures who were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's not only people we need to listen to. We need to listen to God's Word. God's Word will guide us. It's able to make us wise for salvation. And we have to be careful when we hear the word salvation, what do we think of? I want to go to heaven when I die. And that is the heart of salvation, new life in Christ Jesus. But salvation is also a level of living. It's living according to God's word. It's being led by his spirit and not being turned aside. And not having to go through the heartbreaks in the lumps that life gives us. We need to fear God. We need to have a serious faith. Fearing God, as it says here in uh, verse 7 of Proverbs 3, that's the Old Testament equivalent. When you read in the Old Testament and it says, fear God, have the fear of God, what it's talking about is believing in God enough to take his word seriously. Believing in God enough to take his word seriously. True faith in the Lord believes his promises. God said it, I believe it. That settles it, is what the bumper sticker said. But it also heeds his warnings. You know, it's important to note that Solomon in the book of Proverbs, he wrote more than one time, the fear of the Lord, which is what? Faith. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or of knowledge. You know, high school graduates, you've, you've mastered a lot of different things. At least the state of Texas thinks you have. You've, you've been certified by someone or another, some administrator, that said you have demonstrated a proficiency in all sorts of subjects, but there's something you're not done with yet. You are still in the process of building what is called a worldview. You're still in the process of building a worldview, which is a comprehensive set of core beliefs which will guide you through life. A comprehensive set of core beliefs which will guide you through life. You know, in, in a sense, and I don't mean to insult these seniors here or, or anyone their age or younger, but in a sense, you're still like wet cement. Wet cement is easily shaped 
and molded. And anyone who is put in a cement slab and then somehow the family pet got loose and ran across it, you know how it can be imprinted in a way you didn't want it to. In that same way, as you go on from this point to college, to the military, to the workforce, wherever the next steps are for you, you're going to be pressed upon. You're going to be pushed in and, and molded by many different forces. Your beliefs about right and wrong, about beauty, about pleasure, about prosperity, and many other things, they're going to be formed over these next few years. And I urge you, with that being the case, let's settle one thing right now. Determine to trust God. Determine to trust God with all your heart. Now we're back to the scripture that I already read once and we'll read it again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. There's this, there's this commitment, there's this trust. God is with me. God will lead me. I need to listen to him. This, as I said a moment ago, it's a settled faith, but it's also this. Maybe I, I could have called it this, and maybe this would have been a better word, a centered faith. A centered faith. A faith that is centered on a crucified Savior, a risen Lord. A faith that, faith that is centered on an almighty God who has made us in his image and it calls us to walk in relationship with him. Center your faith on the Lord. And if you'll make that choice now, then the third ingredient in this three-ingredient recipe becomes so much easier. It'll fall into place, and that is... A righteous walk. A righteous walk. Shun evil, Solomon writes to his son. Shun evil. Now, evil is not a politically correct word in this age. We're not really supposed to say evil anymore. No. Who, who's, who are you to call this evil? It's just an alternative. Alternative lifestyle. Alternative choice. What's right for me might not be right for you. And who are you to think and suggest otherwise? Well, I'm not telling you any more than to bear witness with other people, but here I am talking about your life, okay? We're talking about the, you building something that's going to stand the test of time, that's going to please God and bless you in the best way. And that is to shun evil. Now, there are two sorts of evil in the world, broadly speaking. There is that which is up front opposed to God and what he calls us to be and do. That sort of evil, maybe it's pretty, it's, it's easier, I think, to stay away from that. Stay away from the occult. Stay away from those who would celebrate Satan. You know, those, those sorts of things, you know, if, if you got any sense, you say, wait a minute, if this stuff is real, I don't need to be playing with it, right? But here's the seductive side of evil, and that is that which lacks a grounding in the good. One of the words in Scripture in the New Testament that's translated evil is a word, it's adikia, dikia, righteousness. Ah, the, the in front of it sort of particle that means un, unrighteousness. Call it evil. It lacks righteousness. It lacks that which gives God pleasure and opens our lives to his blessing. And that is the sort of evil 
that'll suck us in in a hurry. It doesn't seem like it really, well, well, hey, there's no pentagram on there. I'm not worshiping Satan. What's the big deal? It's unrighteous. There's nothing good about it. If, as I believe, there is an almighty creator, your creator and mine, guess what? He has the right. To tell us how we ought to live. It's that simple. Do you believe in God? We already covered that in ingredient number two, right? Then he has the right to tell us how we ought to live. He has absolute authority to establish rules of right and wrong and to hold us to them. And he is entirely justified in allowing us to suffer the bitter fruit of our disobedience. As individuals, as a nation, as a world. And we can disagree here and there on what God asks of us, but there are certain standards which are without question. Standards like, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness or lie. You shall not covet. With God's help, obedience to his commands is possible for every single one of us. And as Solomon says to his son, and I am saying to you, if you consistently choose that path of obedience, you are going to be better for it. As, the, as Proverbs 3 closes the passage we looked at today verse 8 puts it so clearly in all your uh, let's see this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones we're not talking about dietary supplements here we're talking about the things that can stir you up and set a fire within that can consume or the things that can, burn, can build up and nourish us. Health to your body, nourishment to your bones. And so here we are, just three simple ingredients. You might not learn to cook much else when it comes to the things of God, but here you go, three things that you can never grow wrong with. A healthy humility... Don't be wise in your own eyes. A serious faith that fears the Lord and does what he says. And then a righteous walk that shuns evil. With those three things, young adults, any of us, we can build a life that God will bless.